Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of Riverside Tales, a podcast brought to you by the Wildlife Association of South India. Wasi, as we are affectionately called, is a not-for-profit society that is engaged in conservation across the mighty Kaveri River. I'm your host Mario Jerome, and on this channel, we bring you stories of real experiences from real people about India's fabulous waterways and the rich wildlife they sustain. If one was to list some of the wildest rivers left in the country today, the Moyar River would top that list. The Moyar isn't as long or as massive as the Kaveri or the Ganga, but her supremacy lies in her rugged and stunning beauty. She is the largest tributary of the Bhavani River, which flows into the Kaveri. Largely protected, her rugged terrain has been left almost untouched by humans. This makes the river an irreplaceable asset to scientists. Today, she hosts the highest diversity of endangered endemic species of the Kaveri River basin, including the humpback marsia that we heard about in the previous episode. In this episode of Riverside Tales, eminent wildlife biologist Dr. A. J. T. John Singh recalls his experiences and observations while on a joint expedition with Wasi into the Great Moyar Valley in search of the legendary humpback marsia. This story was first published by the Sanctuary Nature Foundation in 2018. The Moyar Valley, beautiful but threatened, by Dr. A. J. T. John Singh. Alarm calls of Chital and Sambar upstream of the Teppapalam Nala between the Bandipur and Satyamangalam tiger reserves in South India indicated that either a sloth bear or leopard or perhaps a tiger was approaching the water at the muddy Nala mouth which drains into the Moyar river. By 10 am the temperature was showing a steady increase and would soon beat the 42 degrees centigrade we had recorded the previous day. Our stay had been arranged at Mangalpatti by the special task force of Tamil Nadu police who had a camp there. The river, after falling into the deep Moyar Gorge, flows along a 30-kilometer-long valley. The steep hills with scanty vegetation on either side do not provide sufficient shade for large mammals in the summer. Animals instead seek the river for respite from the sun. As the alarm calls echoed in the valley, I hid behind a three-stemmed mesquite tree, an exotic to India, and waited for the predator to approach. I have often risked doing this during the last 40 years of my wanderings in the jungle, but would not recommend it to anyone. That eventful morning, I saw a tiger walking through the bushes along the Nala, just 20 meters in front of me. It was a memorable sight to see the reddish golden fur of the striped cat shining bright in the morning sun, ambling over the black rocks towards me. I took three photographs as it emerged from the cover. I expected the tiger to reach the water within seconds. There was a little fear in my heart as I was on the ground and if it was a mother followed by young cubs, an aggressive demonstration was possible if I was detected. The tiger stopped abruptly, froze for a split second. It looked beyond me to my left, where a colleague sat on the ground in the open at the edge of the Nara, taking pictures of the tiger. His movements were seen by the tiger, and it immediately turned around and ran away, even without a growl. This incident occurred in 2016, when I was on a survey of orange-finned Masaya in the Moyar River with colleagues from Vasi. The Moyar Valley serves as a vital corridor between the western and the eastern Ghats. Our campsite on the left bank of the Moya River was particularly picturesque and we slept to the sound of the rapids steadily thundering downstream. During our stay, we walked up and down the river bank for nearly 30 kilometers, trying to catch some orange finned marsia. This iconic sport fish, also known as the humpbacked marsia, is endemic to the Kaveri River Basin, which includes the Kaveri, Kabini, Moyar, Bhavani, and Pambar rivers. 
The riverine forest with giant ancient trees rejoiced in the spring air, sprouting new leaves. In species such as the Irukpai tree, the leaves were yellowish brown now, but would later turn dark green. The giant Arjun trees adorned parakeet green colored leaves. Langurs fed on the leaf petioles and dropped the rest, which were to be enjoyed by wild ungulates such as Cheetal, Sambar, and Gaur. Some of the Malabar ebony trees were in bloom and others had fruits. Langurs were partial to these flowers. And the fallen ones in the water were avidly devoured by fishes, especially the common Carnatic ka. Langur also feed on the sprouting beedi leaves and the leaves of the pongam tree. We heard and saw colourful Indian giant squirrels scuttling across the canopy. We had several sightings of crocodiles on the river banks, but none of otters. Riverine forests struggle with regeneration as the vegetation is predominated by large and ancient trees. Ungulates which throng the area and feed on the newly sprouted vegetation during the summer months could be the factor impeding this process. Spring also ushers in the breeding season and birds such as the stock-billed kingfisher and the grey-headed fish eagle emitted mournful calls in the air. Male grey francolins called and challenged one another near our campsite. All along the rivers, there were several groups of yellow-billed babblers. Male and female paradise flycatchers hunting in the same location indicated this as their breeding area of choice. And blue-eared kingfishers flew from rock to rock in search of the tiny fishes they were so adept at catching. However, I hardly heard the grey jungle fog. Perhaps the lack of sufficient ground cover in the thorn scrub forest around our camp may be the reason for their near absence. We found the remains of several gore along the river banks, evidence that tigers often kill these large wild cattle. During our four day stay, we saw at least 1000 cheetal, a hundred black buck, several gore, and sambar. Interestingly, cheetal and black buck were often seen together. When flushed out, the black bucks ran toward the open area, while Cheetal continued to run parallel to the riverine vegetation. Contrary to the belief that black bucks are animals of flat to undulating open country, once a group of eight black bucks was seen following a group of sambar along the steep slope of a hill. This capability of the black buck in the landscape to climb hills enables them to colonize areas such as Anaikatti and parts of the Madhumalai Tiger Reserve. One group of Cheetal frequented the STF campsite each night. Perhaps they assumed the open yard to be safe from the stalking predators, the leopard and the tiger. Yet, the STF staff informed us that the leopards had been seen near the campsite and the night prior to our arrival, one had been seen running across the camp. However, we braved it outside our tents, sleeping under a star-studded sky. The new moon was just growing and every night we saw the crescent of the moon descending towards the western horizon as we sat outside the tent until slumber got the better of us. The nights were not silent as peacocks meowed from the canopies of trees and Cheetal punctuated the silence with their rutting calls. There were also alarm calls of Sambar and Cheetal. The Cheetal and Black Buck seem to prefer the left bank of the Moya River as there is an approximately 3 km long and 100 to 300 m wide flat area which falls within the Bandipur Tiger Reserve. In open areas, there were many dung piles of Black Buck indicating that the courting adult males displayed these piles in such areas known as Lek to woo the females which have the option to move from Lek to Lek to select the best males. This small stretch of habitat needs the special attention of the Karnataka Forest Department as the area has the potential to support a large number of black buck and cheetal. On an earlier trip in November 2009 with my colleague R. Raghunath from the Nature Conservation Foundation, I had seen nearly 200 black buck here. The vegetation on the flat area had species such as Krishna, East Indian satinwood, Chinese lantern tree, wavy trumpet flower tree, anjan and Mysore sumac. 
The presence of neem and tamarind trees suggested that the area was possibly planted in the past. Porcupines had debarked the bottom of most neem trees. However, neem and tamarind do not diminish the habitat quality of the area and the more problematic species that significantly reduced the habitat quality for black buck and cheetal were the mesquite and prickly pear. These species make the habitat too dense for the above two ungulates, which need large meadows for feeding and yarding. Often, I wonder how the soft padded tiger and leopard are able to hunt in the Moya Valley, where the ground has an abundance of thorn as a result of the prickly pear. There was also copious growth of other inedible species such as Bala and Bantulsi. Meadow dependent black buck and cheetal will prosper well in this habitat if the mesquite and the prickly pear are controlled. This is vital as it is the only habitat supporting a good population of black buck in the Bandipur Tiger Reserve. However, given the tenacity of such problem floral species, only sustained efforts can help control and eradicate them. We had seen signs, pug marks, scats and scrapes of both the tiger and leopard all along the riverine forest. One sign of tiger claw marks, possibly by a large male tiger, on an Arjun tree was remarkable as it was at a height of over 3 meters. Leopards too seem to use the area, perhaps due to the abundance of smaller prey such as porcupine, langur, black buck and cheetal, and scalable trees and steep hills needed to escape in the event of an encounter with a tiger. Trees are also important to escape from doles which also frequent the area. Leopards are equally at ease in rocky areas with little vegetation. A fact that was proved by our sighting of one basking on a rock hardly 50 meters from the road as we were driving out of the camp in the morning. While no such plans are afoot, I could not help but think that the Moyar landscape would also be a perfect choice for cheetah reintroduction in South India. However, this would be conditional to the control of the mesquite and the prickly pear. A near 600 square kilometer habitat is available with an abundant population of cheetal and other prey including chausinga. Nilgai and chinkara that were once found in this landscape could be brought back too. As I left the Moyar Valley, my thoughts rambled between the tiger that had been fairly close to me while on foot and the leopard restfully basking in the sun. And above all, the majestic trees in the riverine forest with its green canopy. We hope you enjoyed that story. Thank you for listening in to the fourth episode of Riverside Tales. Don't forget to tune in every first Saturday of the month for our next installment. This series is brought to you by Wasi as part of their Golden Jubilee celebrations. To learn more about Wasi's conservation work in the Kaveri Basin, do visit and subscribe to Wasi's website, Instagram and Facebook pages. If you liked what you heard today, please do follow the podcast. Give us a like or a quick review and do share the podcast with your friends. From me, Mario, and our producer, Arvind Raj, a very goodbye until the next episode.